Hello, guys. Hi. Hi Hello. Bob. How's, how's it going? At no expense spared. This is the Bob and Ramon show outside broadcast unit. We've literally, behind the cameras here, we've got dozens of oppos, servants, lackeys, butlers. We've got catering, off catering truck, off camera, lighting. We've, it's unbelievable expense. Or, more likely, we've got an iPad, an iPhone, and we're using Ramon's uh, excellent Samsung... Samsung... Uh, no, 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 no. Huawei? Yeah. Huawei. Huawei. Yes. You can't use those anymore for British security, you know that. Well, I mean, seeing as British intelligence, you know. I'm, I'm not in British intelligence. You're I've not, got, I'm not, I'm uh, British, but I've got no intelligence. Right. Right. Having okay. covered that. Anyway, so this is the setup for today. Um, no guitars, motorbikes in the background. So different kind of sound mixing problems for which a prior apology. But we're in a very special place. We're in a bit of a shrine. We certainly are. But we're, we're actually at um, Decca Studios which um, we've actually featured on the channel before, but we, we thought we'd come back and um, give it its just desserts and really just go through a bit of the history of the place and just, you know, just take it right back to, to the beginning of yeah. when it first started, which was actually, um, Bob, um, in 1980, sorry, 60, 18, sorry, no. 61. No, no, we're going to take it back further. We're going to oh. go to 1888. 1888? This, yeah, this was originally what this, this place here behind us, um, was originally the West Hampstead Town Hall. Okay, so we were at the Town Hall, and and it was it was hired out for private functions, you know, um, and it was actually called the the Moonlight Club, um, you know, which is the Town Hall, and they, they used, there was a big sort of hall in here with a stage. Was hang on, was this called the Moonlight Club? Yes. No, it the, wasn't. No, the Moonlight Club. <laughs> Moonlight Club wasn't until the 80s or 90s. You know what? Let, let me have a look here in my notes. Right, I th I think. Because I'm old enough to remember, not the 1880s, but the 1970s. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, you're right. You, sorry, you are right. But, but, but. And the bit we haven't talked about yet became the yeah. Moonlight Club. Became the Moonlight Club. You know what? Should we start this again? No, we're having such fun. So, th so this was hired out for private functions and it had a really big hall, which um, later became Studio One. Okay. Um, and that was, um, it was a big stage and it was used in the 1920s for private hire maybe weddings, you know, private functions, and, and that was way back in the 1920s. Um, Decca Records was formed in 1929, um, and it was really, um, um, it started off um, by, um, it was actually bought, or was, rather this place was bought by a guy called Sir Edward Lewis, okay? Probably and, Edward Lewis back in those days, before he got a sir on it. Yes, uh, he was originally a stockbroker. I wonder so, how much he had to give to a political party to get that sir back in those days. Well, you know, now with inflation, it's probably five hundred thousand quid for a peerage. Oops, but <laughs> but back in the day, maybe it was about what a thirty bob and change between the wars. Be, yeah, it could be. Could it be cheap? So so this so, so originally this place, um, uh, well, you know, in the whole um, recording industry, the vinyl recording industry, um, this this guy Edward Lewis, um, he actually. Um, had a company called Crystallate Vinyl. Now, I don't know if he actually bought it. I think he bought the company. Uh -huh. But um, Chris, Crystallate Vinyl actually made records. And they, they were kind of like an early record company. You know, you had EMI and you had Crystallate. 78's in shellac at the time. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, in 19, we're going we're to fast forward to 1948, and then it became a fully fledged um, studio. And then, I think that's right. And um, just about... Uh, um, just behind Bob here is a is a blue plaque, um, and it's, um, uh, it's. We'll put a close up in right now. And this is actually um, in, in sort of memory of uh, Lonnie Donegan's. Um, you know, he, he kind of came here a, um, uh, uh, with a great artist, in British artist called Chris Barber. It was Chris Barber and um, Hugh Mendel was uh, the producer on this session, and um, it was in 1954. And they released an album, they recorded a whole album called New Orleans Joy's Album, okay? But on that album, there was one particular well, they, track. They, they, they basically ran out of material before they finished cutting an album. So they went to the pub, had a drink, came back, did a couple of jazz jams, and they were still wanting a bit. So Hugh Mendel asked them, have you got anything else? And Lonnie Donegan, who was just pioneering Skiffle at the time, actually literally lobbed out Rock Island Line. And that's where it was recorded and came from. And yeah. it then became a success 
a few years, I think probably 57, a few well, years later. Actually, um, so just to mention, Chris Barber played double bass and um, I don't think... Trumpet player, wasn't he? Yeah, he wasn't even, he wasn't known as a double bass player and, and I think uh, Lonnie Donegan said, can you play double bass? And, and Chris Barber said, yeah, I can. Great musician. And anyway, so, so they released uh, the album, um, New Orleans Joy's album in 1954. Um, but then they re-released the single Rock Island Line in, in November um, 1955. Five, okay. You know, um, Just after I was born. Yes. So that's when it really became, that's when the whole skiffle About thing... a couple of yeah. months before they put the last last stones in at Stonehenge. <laughs> <laughs> well, apparently I'm, I'm, I'm older than you. According to some of our fans. According to, well, no, you've got your hat on tonight, so nobody's... <laughs> Don't look under me for that. Ah! Um, so anyway, um, so Jimmy Page, yeah, he's a young lad, trying to learn guitar, sorry, red London bus going past him, um, he's trying to learn guitar, what does he learn? He learns, what does he listen to? He listens to... Skiffle. Skiffle. Well, so did the Beatles. Yeah. Well, the Quarrymen. The Quarrymen were a Skiffle, Skiffle fan, band. yeah. So yeah. this is a really important thing. It was a thing. huge craze in the yeah. late, late 50s. And the great thing about Skiffle was, it was really cheap because you needed a guitar, you hit something, mm -hmm. you had a bass that was probably a a, 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 um, a, a, a packing case yeah. with a broomstick and a bit of string. Like a tea chest. A tea chest, that's a tea it. Chest, yeah. doom, 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 doom. Yeah. Kind of just doom, not really in tune either. And these tea chests would have come from, you know, the Far East, but maybe, you know, to... These tea chests would have come with tea from... They would have come with tea from the Far East. Or yeah. They would have been, you know, packing cases in the old days before cardboard, before Amazon. Yes, but it would have been a thin... Thin, I can remember. You can really tell we're doing an outside broadcast because we've got complete yeah. control. We've we sealed off the whole area. The whole area is completely sealed off, obviously. So there's no traffic. You can't hear any traffic. If you're hearing any traffic, it's it's an illusion, or or we've added the sound effect later for credibility. Bob's got friends in high places. <laughs> so <laughs> that goes enough bloody money to buy. Carry yeah. on, Sergeant. So okay. So these are the step the steps that we're actually sitting on. This is this is the, the interesting. Thing. So. So, so the steps that we're actually sitting on, this is the, the, the really interesting thing, is four um, guys from Liverpool um, in 1962, 1st of January. 1st so of January. After Christmas, uh, after New Year's Eve. Lousy so, weather, what, the yeah, coldest, coldest winter in record. Yeah. And uh, four Liverpud Liverpudians, Liverpl Liverpudians. That's it. Would have walked up these very steps these very very steps and to they audition yeah and they would have been a, they had a hangover because they'd they been hangover, out the, yeah. two, the previous night yeah uh and they arrived late and it wasn't by all account it was a, it was a pretty frictionful session yeah. and of course we're talking about the beatles here and brian epstein their manager was really angry because he'd set up a um this he set up this session and, and dick rowe was actually the a and r guy here at decca at that time um and um, I think Mike Smith was also part of the, you know, the management here, and uh, for the artist management, or whatever. And um, basically, the story was that Brian Epstein was really, really not happy with the Beatles because they, you know, they, they're four lads, and they, I think it'd taken them like 18 hours to drive down. They had a horror journey, horror journey because of snow yeah. and rain and shit. You know, and you know, they're four lads in a car because Brian Epstein got the train down. Whereas, you know, then, then I think they... Probably, he probably got the Pullman, in which case he would have been smoking smoking a fine cheroot and he probably yes. would have been eating a little beef and red wine in the dining car. Absolutely. Just like you. Sure. If yeah. only, if only. A life I used to live. <sighs> yes. Um, so, I digress. Um, Brian Epstein, he's, he's arrived here. He's waiting for them. And uh, they finally arrive. And, um, and they actually do a pretty good job. Actually, Brian Epstein is actually really happy with their performance. You know, it's quite a, quite a nice performance that they do but like i said um mike smith actually declined them he heard he heard them and he just said no guitars are on the way out guitars are on the way out as as a uh, dear reader you will um have understood they have continued to be on the way out ever since and they continue to be on the way out even today yeah yeah so, with prices rising through the roof sales of guitars and amplifiers at record levels but even them they're still in yeah. decline okay <laughs> so so anyway, um, you know, what a mistake. That was probably, you know, um, so Decca were kind of labelled the, the kind of the guys that made the biggest mistake in rock history, you know, rock, you know, in, in the music industry. Yep. And, um, you know, it's like uh, it was a, a, a tragic mistake of Greek 
proportions. Well, you know. what, what's so interesting also, <laughs> there's a little, you know, because I spent most of my life, you know, in like, you know, work in offices and in management. And there's a really interesting management lesson here, which is who's the guy, there's a guy, this guy Dick Rowe, right, was the guy who got it in the neck for the guy who turned down the Beatles on the basis of the session in the, in the building behind us. Yeah. And yet, you know, a little bit of historical delving to, shows that it's actually this Mike Smith who declined them and not Dick Rowe. So Dick Rowe, as it often in management, carried the can for a dodgy decision through history. But as unjustly. We're, as we're going to find out, he, he made some great decisions like the Moody Blues. Yeah. I think he's, I think he, uh, maybe David Bowie, he was here, wasn't he? I mean, David Bowie cut his first records here. As well, well. Da David Bowie's kind of troubled, difficult, can't get a grip on a market years. He was with Decca. That's absolutely right. And it wasn't until he got to RCA uh, that he started releasing the stuff that was yeah. obviously historic and the rest is, is you know, And coming back to history. the Coming back to the Beatles, Bob, um, the one good thing about Decca was um, uh, Brian Epstein had recorded the Beatles here. So they, so then Brian Epstein actually had some tapes that he could then go out to other record yeah. labels and use yeah. and, and show that this is what we recorded at Decca. So in a way, it wasn't a completely Absolutely. wasted... Absolutely. But um, even then, even then, by all accounts, it was slow going until they got to Parlophone. And then Parlophone, which were a bit of an afterthought label within the EMI group at the time. So remember all the big groups, EMI and Decca, those days. I mean, the big money was in jazz and classical. It was sober music, you know. This youngster stuff, rock and roll, guitar -y stuff. It's, you know, flash in the pan. Anyway, uh, so, you know, but Parlophone took an interest. And the rest is history because Beatles signed up with Parlophone released those albums and became arguably the greatest pop band that the world's ever seen. So so then the, the, the a and R people, um, Dick Rowe, whatever, then he goes to the Crawdaddy Club in 1963. And who does he spot there, Bob? He spots Michael Jagger Esquire and his bunch of well-known or should we say Brian Jones, because he was a leader. Brian Jones was a leader, but, but all, Brian Jones all, all those chaps, who, all those young men who, who were playing in, you know, Surrey at the time, but obviously had grown up, you know, in, in the badlands of Memphis and places yeah. like that. Yeah. Oh, no, no, sorry, the badlands of Surrey. And, um, yeah, and uh, basically the guys, those guys who were instrumental along with a few others, all of whom I worship, in basically taking the blues out of America, repackaging it, and sending the blues back. I mean, the story of the blues, with its kink over to England, is a wonderful and unexpected story. Yeah, and also, uh, just an uh, interesting point is that um, Andrew Oldham, who was their Andrew manager... Andrew Lou Oldham. He didn't actually like Decker. He didn't like the engineers. He didn't like the studio sound. He no. didn't like the equipment, the desk. So he actually, and also he wanted to have more control, and he actually produced them, because obviously, I think if you produce them, then you get what's called points on the track yeah. and make more money yeah. uh, and um, so that was kind of a way he, he became more, more involved in and the, the studio actual... behind us Decca uh, was notoriously conservative you know the the, yeah. the, the the producers and the engineers actually wore the brown coats like Ronnie Barker wore in um, Open All Hours you know yeah. like shopkeeper classic coats. British sitcom you know um, and, 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 and uh, you know they, they, they actually wore effectively kind of like electrical engineers yeah. clothing and they saw themselves as electrical and electronics yeah engineers. they all had these like sort of overalls in yeah. those aprons and whatever, you know you paint. needed a degree in audio to work yeah. here and stuff like that yeah. it was a very very serious business yeah and that's why a lot of the guys Bob I think they, they actually invented you know if if somebody wanted something like it in, in, just down the road here in Abbey Road if somebody wanted a, a piece of kit they'd make it they'd have a workshop yeah. at the back and they'd actually make the, Absolutely. the equipment yeah. to, to use you know? so listen are we going to talk about not only this, these steps in this building but this immediate vicinity we can talk about anything you like, Bob. Anything, as long as it's not innuendos, because we've been no, we don't, no, we, we're not allowed to we're, we're done with innuendos. There will be no further mentions of the size of hands, feet, and other appendages in this video. Exactly. Are we so, clear? Are we clear on that? We are very, we are clear, very yes. clear. Yes. On that, apologies. Well, apologies. We're okay. Well, anyway, in this street, <laughs> which is um, Broadhurst Gardens, London Northwest Six, um, adjacent, just on the corner mm -hmm. to my left, your right, uh, is a pub. Uh, the pub is called the Railway Arms or the Railway Tavern. Uh, it's been there forever. It's been there since the late uh, 19th century. And it's, you know, a classic big corner pub. You know, big, tall, wind, tall, tall, big windows, upstairs, function room, and so on. And it's also got uh, a, a back room, which is on the side, which is just again along from me. And that room was most important because that room was this club that opened in 1961 called Kluke's Clique. 
That's right. Named yeah. after a jazz musician. Uh, or a jazz album. I think it was a jazz album. Or maybe it's a musician. I think it was some. Uh, it was. Um, let me just. It was a Kenny Clark. Kenny Clark. How come I've got all this information? You've got it, all this information. It, so Cooks, Clark, yeah. it started as a jazz club from 1961 until 1970, and uh, Dick Jordan and Jeff Williams. Um, were the two guys that um, started it. And it was an amateur mm. endeavour. They, yeah. they both had day jobs. I think one of them yeah. worked in advertising and the other one worked in, in photography or, 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 yeah. or something like, or design, something yeah. like that. So they're in the creative industries in, in back in the day yeah. when it was a tiny village. I think they were doing TV adverts, weren't they, or something like that? I think something to do with oh, cinema. They were, the cinema like adverts. Yeah, yeah well, cinema no, that's adverts. right. In, the, in those days, the cinema companies all used to yeah. make up these ads for their clients. So they, they'd go to the local curry house and say, advertise in the local flea pit. Um, advertised your curry house and so you used to get these incredibly cheap and nasty and rather funny ads saying you know the curry place just 50 yards around the corner and, and they were quite good value actually were, you know part it's part of the whole cinema going experience before you got to the posh ads you had all the local ads and they used to stitch all them together and anyway these two guys um, were uh, basically as an amateur endeavor they, they, they ran this jazz club of an evening above this pub and it was a seven day a week affair and it yeah. morphed as musical taste did across the decade from jazz through into uh, what we call kind of pop and and then beat, rock and, the rock and then and then rock and the people that played yeah. here and we'll go through a bit of a list yeah. unbelievable so just just point that the the, the the kooks kooks click album was by kenny clark released in 1956 if, if anyone's interested but let's talk about some of the performers we and this is something I didn't know. I was shocked. But Stevie Wonder performed there in 1966. Okay, ten years after, in 1968. I would so love to have seen ten years after playing. They played here quite a lot, quite regularly. And I would so love to have seen that band. I mean, I love the first three albums before they became famous. You know, did the Woodstock thing. And they're a pretty derivative British blues band. I don't think they set the world alight like the Blues Breakers, but. Um, I thought they were a fantastic band. I thought Alvin Lee was a wonderful guitar player, and I thought the rest of the band really tight and solid and underneath it. I'd love to have seen him in a room this size. A, well. ba a band that I would have loved to have seen is the Graham Bond oh, organization. He played here a lot. Yeah, with ov obviously Ginger Baker on drums, Jack Bruce, Jack Bruce on bass, Dick yeah. Hexel Smith on sax. Yeah. Shame was he had a terrible heroin problem, ended up killing himself. Yeah, I think it was the uh, six thirty from Paddington. <laughs> Seriously, yeah. Um, he threw himself underneath it. Didn't yeah. He? Oh. Yeah. Oh, oh I think horrible. no. I think it was in. Um, I tell you where it was. It was Wimbledon or somewhere like that. Maybe Wimbledon or it? Clapham. It was Clapham Junction or Wimbledon, somewhere around there. You know. Very sad. But again, you know, I mean, that was probably probably the first supergroup, Graham Bond, yeah. back because you had all these amazing musicians coming out of it. Of the formation of Cream. Of course, and yeah. the other bands of note that played there were Led Zeppelin, El ah, Elton John. Imagine seeing Led Zeppelin in that room up there. Deep Purple, Fleetwood Mac. Cream, um, and then it changed. Like we were, uh, it changed to the Moonlight Club in 1977 until 1993. That coincided, of course, 1976, as you will well know, was the summer of hate in London, and that's when the punk thing exploded. Mm -hmm. So when the Moonlight came along, it was all about punk, post-punk, new wave, and of yeah. course two-tone. So you know the high energy kind of the specials the, played the scar seventy nine the scar thing so you know all, all that yeah. stuff used and I used to come here back in those days it's fantastic venue really? yeah um, Adam and the Ants and also you two did their first ever English I gig. missed that imagine that first ever English gig at Cook's Creek so that was um, that was a really interesting thing so I mean um, also this coming back to the studio um, Bing Crosby. Recorded here with the orchestra. Smooth old crooner. You know, we're going to talk about Lulu, Tom Jones, David Bowie. Um, and then let's talk about some of the engineers, Gus, um, Glyn Jones and Gus jo Glyn Jones. Glyn Jones and Gus Dudgeon. Yeah, I mean, in, remember back in those days, I mean, you had EMI and Decca, those two businesses, basically owned most of the, 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 the labels on which stuff was published. They owned the studios. It was a whole, you know, end-to-end -end process. Uh, artist and repertoire in those days used to mean that they used to manage the artist and put the artist with their repertoire. Very few people sang their own songs until the arrival of the Beatles. If you think about it, even the Rolling Stones weren't singing their own songs. They were singing the, you know, the, the, the American blues musicians' songs to begin with before yeah. they started writing. But, yeah. So A&R meant a different thing, but they, they were end to end. So all, most of the studios, there weren't many independent studios back in those days. So again, it was a tiny world not least in the staff in the studios, you know. Yeah, and for me, um, 
Bob, the, the, the one album that really got me into guitar playing was obviously Eric Clapton and the Blues Breakers, which is for me, I think this is like the mecca for guitar play, electric, especially electric guitar Recorded players. in here. You know, uh, and it was, you know, so Eric Clapton was carrying his Marshall 2x12 and his Lester up these very stairs. Up these very steps. And, and, into, into that. and he was a young man then, but I yeah. bet if he was here, he'd attest the fact it was yeah. bloody heavy even then. Have yeah. you picked up one of those Blues Breakers? No, but we're gonna we're gonna do a video on one of them. No, it's, it's like a Fender Twin. It's, yeah. yeah. Um, so that once was once again. You need your extensive retinue of staff if you use equipment and, like that. And, and this is such a legendary place, Bob. That not only did Eric Clapton, who is you know probably the most famous electric guitar player walking the planet, but Django Reinhardt recorded here as did well. Did he? Yes. Oh. So he actually came here. I think it was. I think it was even pre-war. I'm not sure if it was after, just after the war. Before, I think maybe it's just before the war. And he actually came here to record. He actually recorded. So, Dara, I'm going to tread on some slightly thin ice here, but, but yeah. bear with me. I wonder how many fingers he had on his left hand at that time. Oh no, he would have had two. He, he had, had two, two and then the, the two kind of right. okay. you know, paralyzed. But okay. you know, this is the interesting thing, guys. This is the spooky thing: is that um, uh, Django Reinhardt and Eric Clapton. Recorded in the same room, same studio. I not not at the same time. Yeah, Studio One or something. I can't remember the. Studio Two, I think it was. Studio Two, yeah. I think it was. Studio, studio Three here is the, the massive one. Studio Three can take a, a whole orchestra. Yeah, it's it's a big big room. I mean, this is a really. We'll do a little walk around, but this is a really big. It's a big complex. It's a big building. Yes, yeah. I big, mean, it's it's, it's now it's now occupied by the English National Opera, but they've actually sold it, and I think it's going to be redeveloped. So the likelihood is property, you know, around this part of London. They're not going to leave this period stuff, you know, yeah. like this. They're probably going to knock it all down and turn it into what, you know, more posh flats. And it's a shame because, as it is now, it's actually the same layout that it was when it was a studio. Yeah. But you know, if they sell it, you know, it's not. It's going to change. Oh God, God, I'd love to see that Zeppelin in that room. Just literally 20 meters, mm -hmm. just up from my my. Actually, yeah. there isn't too much to film inside because it is a rehearsal studio. Yeah, not so much it's, to see. You know, it's. And apparently, uh, when they when they did sell this building to this these new guys, um, they had a skip where they just threw everything away, like from the studio. So imagine the treasures that they threw away. Oh, there would certainly have been, you know, many lost master tapes, multi tracks. Yeah. Maybe the reverb, the the, the, the reverb, and stuff. Um, yeah, and bits bits yeah. of gear, the reverb tank. Yeah. Uh, you know. Plates, um, reverb plates. Reverb plates, whatever, you know, the stuff. They, they, but they, stuff the reverb, the I think the reverb plates were actually in the, in the basement. They kept them in the basement. And um, they had a few of them here. Okay, they need somewhere stable. So anyway, what we're going to do now is we're going to go for a quick walk around. A little bit of a back view of the whole place. Hi there. So we're around the back of the Decca Studios now. Up the chuff, as they say. And this um, entrance was made famous one day because Bing Crosby had been recording in here and he came out at the back, his limo was waiting, more or less exactly where I'm standing. Um, Sir Michael Lewis, who owned Decca by then, was clearly on parade that day with a major artist from America in tow uh, and officiating. Um, we'll see if we can find a photograph of that, I think, um, because uh, it's quite a good sesh. Um, and you can, cut, if you pan off to, um, to the right, you can see how big this place is. Um, so this is basically the back of Studio 3, which is the orchestral room. And then you're going into that, the, this is now the wig department for the English National Opera here. And this would have been uh, either the engineering department or possibly even Studio 2, uh, because Studio 2 was definitely on the lower floor. Um, but this okay, is... complete with the extras. Here we go. We're now walking around the back of West Hampstead Muse into a little muse called Exeter Muse. And Exeter Muse is the side. Okay, so basically you can just see how big, how long the stretch is. I mean, it's a huge building. And uh, here we have as well, this is, this is the interesting part here, is if we look up here, this is where the Cook's clique would have actually been. Now, Bob and I are debating, was it there? And I think it was, I think these lights you can see here through the window, I think that was the actual Cook's clique. That's now a solicitor's Club. office, isn't it? It's a solicitor's office. It used to be owned by the pub, but they've sold it off. And um, that's actually a solicitor's office. So it no longer exists as a, as a, a, a function room. So you can't perform in there. 
unless you want to go and uh, get divorced or something. But given that, that so, so Decca is uh, to the right of the screen at the moment with the blue yeah. windows. So what and, they, and they used to run cables across, didn't they? They actually went across the roof. So this is why I think that this would have been completely not below it because they actually ran cables across the roofs from the roof of Decca to Cook's Leaks and that's how they made those live albums. For example, I think 10 years after um, made a live album um, in that place there. So They did? Yeah, and I that think, was actually recorded. I think it's the second album. I think it might be called Undead. That's right, and I think um, also, um, I think uh, there were some live albums. Um, I think uh, there was a, a producer, I can't remember the engineer or producer, I think it may be Gus Judgeon, Gudgeon, who actually recorded jazz artists. And uh, that's how the whole, um, sorry, can I just, just cut that? So Bob, I think that's actually how um, the, you know, the Kooks Click started um, along with, um, as a jazz club and they'd actually record those jazz artists for Decca. So I think that's exactly how, that's one of the reasons they started to record live albums. And of course that obviously went on. And um, John Mel's Blues Breakers actually did an album like that, a live album which was never used but they actually, I think it's come out now, I think if I'm right in saying, but um, John Mel recorded a whole album here. And that was in the album. days, of course, I mean, you think, think about, you know, these days, there'd be more cable than a Christmas tree, but back in those days, you're yeah. talking about a four track. Yes, so it'd just be a snake, probably one or two cables across. Yeah. And, Very uh, doable. Yeah, so that, that's basically the place where all these legendary bands performed, and, um, you know, Cream performed one of their sh first shows there. And um, obviously John Mel's Blues Breakers, Eric Clapton played with the Red Telecaster through a Vox amplifier. Now I know while you're here that you're on the search for the Holy Grail because what you want to find is that kind of step or ledge yeah. that the Blues Breakers are sitting on on the cover yeah. of the Beano album. And yeah. you've been all around the neighbourhood. I have. I've searched for this, yeah. And we can't find it. We think we've got we've we've got a couple of front runner places. We think behind yeah. that red wall. That, it could well be there. Right, behind there. Or, or it could be here where they This been. is This is all new yeah. here. Lovely, isn't it? Very yeah. stylish. We bring you to all the nicest places. And uh, we think it may be behind here. We can't find it. Well, no, if I, if I was making a hip-hop album, that would be a pretty cool backdrop. It would be the business. You know I mean? so, it would be the dogs. Yeah. So it's probably somewhere around here because they wouldn't have gone far. You know, um, and Eric Clapton was looking pretty miserable on that album cover. Um, for whatever reason he God didn't knows really... why if he, if he only knew what he knows now he would have been well <laughs> yeah. pleased with himself <laughs> well yeah but um, so th this is a, it's just a really interesting place because there's not many you know London is obviously it's very expensive to buy land here and here you've got a massive studio with, that could hold a whole orchestra if we just pan around to the length of it you can see just how long this building is and it's just one of the only few places where it was a recording studio but it was also place that you could fit a whole orchestra into. A few million quid here, yeah. And you can see obviously why they want to sell it. For profit. Right, we're back. Just to finish off the video, cover it off. Uh, as I say, no expense at all. The one thing I did want to show you about all this is that we've even got our own specialist lighting in today. Um, I've never seen such a pair of white shoes as are illuminating our chins. Yeah. Ramon has got these fantastic, are they Nikes? Yeah, you know status quo influence. Status, status quo status influence. Quo. I mean, how can, you can't beat Rick Prophet with white trainers, you know, um, blue jeans. Well, and especially you know? because you, you, you have an Essex association as well, don't you? I do, was he from Essex? No. But, no, no, I'm from Essex. But yeah, the white I'm, shoes are? Yeah, I'm a total Essex chav. A geezer. And I'm not ashamed to say it. A geezer. Essex is, it's, Essex is the new, it's, uh, well, I don't know what it is. New Silicon Valley? Yeah, I mean, like, my, my, my friend was... The new Kabul? Yeah, I mean, South End on Sea. So it's a very exotic place, isn't it? South End on Sea. Well, they've got palm trees. Yeah. So, you know, it's a nice... South End on Sea, guys. If you ever come from America, American friends, if you ever come to England, you know, forget the Algarve, forget um, Saint-Tropez, that's all just rubbish. You want to get down to the, the Welk Hut at Leon Sea. Yeah, Leon Sea, South Welk. End on Sea is... is they're you know. just they're a, a, an English delicacy. They're just like chewing rubber bands that have been soaked in vinegar. Absolutely. Yeah. And if that doesn't put you off, nothing will. I think that's enough from us for tonight, don't you? I think that's enough. I think we've bored everyone to tears. Oh, well, here you go. Anyway, this is... Uh, for, good night from me, and it's good night from him. And good night from me on location this on time. On location, Decker Studios, man, check it out. It's amazing. See you next time. Bye. Take care. Bye.